The Dollop Crossover Special Event, week three of our Henry Kissinger series. And and the the stress is getting to everyone. Uh, David and Gareth fighting viciously. Uh, um, I'm not, I mean, I've been quite calm. I just, I just, when I'm attacked. <laughs> like Henry Kissinger, I am attempting to maintain a balance of power between you and, yeah, and, and you, the state of detente. You get it. Mm -hmm. You have the answers. <laughs> yes, yes. Our podcasts are now bombing Cambodia. Uh, um, <laughs> finally, a show that I relate to. <laughs> oh boy! Well, this is this is week three. Can y'all believe we're already in the home stretch of uh, of this this series? Is it week I mean, three? Yes. Wow. <laughs> Episodes I can't five we've been and six today. together for three weeks. I know. <laughs> Most podcasts don't make all of the guests live together, but we, how do they we, do it? What do they? Yeah, do? I I think with like like the the internet. Mm, I'm gonna have to look that up in my dictionary. Yeah, um, so, well, uh, I've enjoyed our time here. I've really like. I don't I don't want to leave. So I mean, but it's, yeah, I mean, I you know we should. I got to go back. Dave <laughs> we, has a family. We could do another couple of episodes on Henry Kissinger, but. You know, let's just do one a year for the next like five years. <laughs> there we we'll go. Just do, we'll just we'll, be like a reunion show. Yeah. What's Henry Kissinger up to? A revival. Yeah. There's probably more chapters coming. Yeah. Hopefully, just dead soon. Hopefully, dead is yeah. what we'll yeah, be up man, to. I don't think that. I don't think that ends it. Somehow, yeah. I feel like that's not going to be enough. Yeah. We'll be doing the episode about how Henry Kissinger brings the army of hell back through a portal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to yeah. somehow fight on both sides of the yeah. Ukrainian war. And, and the army yeah. of hell's been misled as to the rationale. They're like, well, you, you mm. said that there was going to be a lot more slavery here. <laughs> Go ahead, wait, follow me. Come with me. I'll show you where they hide the WMDs. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Henry Kissinger. I should have <laughs> yeah. studied uh, Kissinger's accent before this. Mm -hmm. I totally blew it. Yeah. You do have an ear for accents. It's all I right. Really do. This will so. be so iconic that it will retroactively become Henry Kissinger's accent. I, kind of like the Nazis are now British. I do. I do one. I do one. Just one That's Kissinger accent. I nail one thing. Hello, Kafka. That's the only really good. <laughs> Perfect. Wow. It's like we're there. It's like we're in the Oval Office. I, I am excited for when. What's his name? The guy who did uh, Vice. Uh, that director. What's his fucking name? You know oh, the movie um, I'm talking about, the Cheney yes, movie. Yes, uh, oh, Adam, McKay. Adam, McK Adam McKay. When Adam McKay does his Kissinger movie in 10 more years, he'll use that accent, David. <laughs> oh. That'll be great. Dave will be on set coaching Christian Bale. Yes. You know, you're saying hello, and it's really more allo, allo, allo. Like aloe vera. Mm -hmm. uh, so... Here at Behind the Bastards, um, and and at the Dollop, uh, which Behind the Bastards is is the Kirkland brand version of, uh, we like to ask questions that historians all too often try to ignore. Namely, how did bad people in history fuck? So, uh, wait, yeah. what's happening? We're, we're talking <laughs> about him. how Kissinger boned. Um, <laughs> are, are you excited for this day? <laughs> no, now I want to go. Can I leave? <laughs> I think he wants to Absolutely go to uh, take care of himself. If you um, understand. You know, this is it is important to both cover the historical crimes of a guy like Kissinger and and to get some personal color. Uh, and since we've spent four episodes talking about his beliefs and his acts and power, it's only fair that we now turn our fuckroscopes onto his sex life. You, mm. you like this that? episode's going to have bass under it, right? Absolutely. Um, so I think the best way for me to start this segment is by reading a quote from a September 15th, 1971 article in the San Francisco Chronicle. As a warning, guys, there is a 30% chance this is going to give one of you a stroke. <laughs> oh, no. You mean, wait, you mean we're going to be stroking it or actual stroke? <laughs> that, that, that is impossible to say. Okay. Quote. Henry Kissinger, sex symbol of the Nixon administration. Sorry, I'm gonna bite a stick. Let me bite a stick. I'm just gonna bite a stick just to be safe. Let me just get a. I'm just gonna get a branch in my mouth. Steps out of his office onto a sun-drenched San Clemente terrace with a cup oh. of black coffee and oh. sits in a white deck chair with his legs crossed. Oh, the thank man God. Who has, <laughs> the man who has pressured Moscow, drafted State of the World addresses, advised the president to enter Cambodia and paved the road to Red China, appears as something of an anachronism in his baggy, midnight blue cotton trousers, what black is... tie shoes, bright blue unfitted blazer, blue and white striped shirt and striped tie. What you guys in holding in so fuck? far? I mean, oh, what? Fuck. Embedded reporter, L.L. Bean. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
what? The Why? Fuck? I can't. I can't imagine combining the fashion <sighs> sense with the war crime. It's so good. <laughs> Because they acknowledge the war crimes yeah, and then go like talk about how he's like, dressed. It's like Henry could be walking down a catwalk like like you'll see Henry right now in a tight white pantsuit. You can mm-hmm. see it sucked to him. Henry also known for ruining Cambodia and Vietnam. <laughs> Spin so around, I'm continue comes, the quote. <laughs> here comes Mass Murder's sex machine. Mm-hmm. Kissinger, oh no, it's an open robe. <laughs> On the back wall, you can see some victims of the Agent Orange campaign in northern <laughs> Vietnam. And <laughs> yes, on that's Henry, seer, sucker. <laughs> you could notice the outline of his hog in those. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know fancy pants brands. Otherwise, I would have finished that, that uh, joke. But I'm going to finish the quote now, because by God, there's more. <sighs> what are you trying to do? Seduce me? Henry will tease as he notices his visitor's hot pants. You know I like these hot pants very much. Then he'll light your cigarette, touching your hand as all Continentals do, offer you a cup of coffee, and discuss trivia as readily as he would a Sino-Soviet entente. The impeccably tidy image is perfect for dealing with Alexei Kostyan or Chowen, uh, or Zawin Lai, or lecturing at Harvard. But one cannot help wonder if the movie stars mind that the ankle socks of Washington's greatest swinger are falling what? down, or what? that his wiry chestnut hair, which flashes golden in the intense white sunlight, is too close-cropped to run their fingers through, or that at least 10 of his 170 <laughs> 78 pounds protrude over his thin black belt, somehow shortening his five feet nine inches. But suddenly, an electric twinkle will flash through the intense blue of his eyes, and one catches an inkling of that movie star magnetism, that special quality which causes some people to call him Cuddly Kissinger. No! Uh, How is that the craziest thing that's happened so far? How is that? How did that happen? Oh, oh my man. god, this is worse than war crimes. <laughs> yeah, this is Oh my god. <laughs> a bottom below the bottom, folks. Uh, can we what? go back to just murdering hundreds of thousands of Cambodians? <laughs> How did that happen? What in the fuck just went on? Is this a guy or a lady writing this? I think know? it's a lady. Probably I'm, one I'm, of the I'm other. certain it's a lady. Yeah. So uh, she wants um, to fuck him. She wants to, or the dude wants to well, fuck him. Well, who wouldn't? Does, he or, holds your hand when he lights your cigarette. Why do we have to talk about Kissinger's chest hair? Why? Why? Why, why indeed? Why indeed, David? Because and can we napalm it? Mm-hmm. That This is what napalm's for, right? <laughs> Speaking there, of palm, a little palm made in that hair of Henry's. This has convinced me there is a place for the B-52 bomber. <laughs> in his pants. Boy, that's what Henry calls little Hank. <laughs> what so, the fuck? Bafflingly, almost impossibly, it is not hard to find articles written at this exact sexual tenor. Oh, and unfortunately, wow. I, I, I would I would love to tell you guys that I'm sure this was like a satire or a joke, but the, uh, people were weirdly serious about this kind of shit. In 1972, and there's no way you're ready for what comes after this part of the sentence. I, I, in I, ni- <laughs> what? In 1972... The Playboy Club hosted a poll of no. the bunnies and asked them who was, quote, the man I would most do like not to go do out on a date with. Henry Kissinger was number oh, one. Oh, <laughs> what my the fuck? God. What in the fuck? No, no, no. What, a, what an horrible indictment of, this no. is the worst indictment of America that has ever been. This is the most damning thing you can we say about us right here. We on the ground in the Playboy Mansion. <laughs> <laughs> what? How is that? I can't. It's like we're in the Back to the Future Biff timeline. Well, hold on. The the man who massacres hundreds of thousands knows how to fuck. That's just an old saying. Mm-hmm. That is. That is an old saying. I want to um, fuck you like I fuck the people of Vietnam over. <laughs> <laughs> So once the first few articles about Henry Kissinger's, you know, sex symbol etude dropped, um, you know, Ugh. Kissinger himself started being questioned by reporters about the phenomenon. His standard reply became one of his most fav- famous quotes: "Power is the ultimate aphrodisiac." Ugh. I mean, I, like there, are, there is. I mean, people are attracted to like. Yeah. Psychos, too. Like, Ted Bundy had, like, a fan club and, like, you know, like, I mean, Je- like, I've been compared to Jeffrey Dahmer a number of times, looks-wise, yes. which has always been a pleasure. And um, you're both very handsome young men. And, um, yes, thank you so much. <laughs> uh, and both still in the primes of our youth. Absolutely. But it's still, it's like, it. you feel like there is a separation <laughs> with him and what 
Uh, it just seems very like a very strange connection. It's it's baffling. Other than that, like here's the sad thing. We're going to get to this. It's not just that he's powerful. And the other thing about him that makes him women so attracted to him is like bleak in a surprising way. But but we'll we'll get to that. So Famous women loved being spotted on Kissinger's arm. One night, he was sighted at the Trader Vic's in the Los Angeles Hilton, oh flirting and holding hands with Jill St. John, who played the, the very first Bond girl. Fuck? What? Come on. He dated the first James Bond girl? Come on! <laughs> The Hague. He needs to be in the Hague. Yeah, and so does Jill St. John, to be honest. (laughs) Jill St. John fucked that little fucking murder troll. That is so horrifying. Who put a pin in that part? But who goes from Bond to murder Munchkin? I mean, Bond is kind of a murder. Like, yeah, uh, but he's a good. He's a good (laughs) guy. Was he? Come on, always the good guy. (laughs) So. While they were out on this date, uh, Jill St. John and Kissinger were spotted by Ann Miller. Uh, Ann was a a dancer, famous dancer at the time. She approached Kissinger and, quote, in a friendly way, these are the words of biographer Walter Isaacson, criticized him for having fun in public while our boys in Vietnam are getting their heads shot off. Kissinger responded dourly, Miss Miller, you don't know anything about me. I was miserable in a marriage for most of my life. I never had any fun. Now is my chance to enjoy myself. When this administration goes out, I'm going back to being a professor. But while I'm in the position I'm in, I'm damn well going to make it count. I mean, really avoiding the uh, <laughs> the central issue. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, at no point does he acknowledge that that is an unfair thing he's doing. He's just like, look, uh, come on, even us, <laughs> you know, psychopaths need to have some fun. <sighs> yeah, and it's it's. I mean. It's nice to hear someone like approach him and and say something like that too. Yeah, yeah, and of yeah. course she approached him for not doing right by our GIs, and as opposed to not doing right, right. by millions of Cambodian and Vietnamese and Bangladeshi it's a morsel. It's a morsel. And Laos and yeah, civilians, but I yes, did, it I is did, a morsel. I did something similar to the lead singer of the Counting Crows. I went up to him and said that his his band was bad, and <laughs> they drove me crazy. So Your I, band's a I, war I, crime. You, you know, Dave, you might have had more of an impact if you'd criticized him for playing his music while our boys in Vietnam are getting their heads shot off. Oh, Matt, <laughs> you would have, you would have had some trouble parsing that out. Sir, are you okay? Uh, you, you, I'm here playing your jam band while our boys in Vietnam are out there dying in the mud. Face down in the muck. How dare you? <laughs> I think you have the wrong person. You're the kind of gross. <laughs> I know what you did. <laughs> Something about a parking lot. <laughs> that that you are you are edging up on my favorite conspiracy theory, which is that the Tonkin Gulf incident was engineered by the Counting Crows in order uh. to sell out <laughs> several decades later. Well, we, we know it was. We yeah, know absolutely. That's a fact. That seems proven at this point. So. <laughs> Biographer Walter Isaacson describes Kissinger as having, quote, the boyish glee of a senior on prom night and and the twinkle of a middle-aged rake. He regularly had, quote, striking blonde women come with him into the White House on lunch dates so he could show them off to his colleagues, telling a co-worker on at least one occasion to eat your heart out. He's very much like bragging to other dudes about the fact that being Henry Kissinger has turned him into a sex symbol. He just had a gun and he was like, no, literally, eat your own heart. (laughs) <laughs> so it was known that Kissinger's notorious temper could be somewhat offset by tossing young women in front of him. When his staffers fucked up and had to give him bad news about a scheduling issue, they'd send the youngest female secretary they had to go and give him the news. The White House press office used Diane Sawyer for this purpose. Oh my god. Oh, <laughs> Eventually no. the two started dating. Oh, oh my god. Fuck. I mean Jesus uh, Jesus Christ. Christ. she should not be allowed to still be doing news. I mean, I know, I know, right? <laughs> you 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 need to have your news license revoked. Do you think it just do you think it just comes pure poison? Oh, yeah. it's like yes. sarin gas. Yes. It's just yeah. like a gas slowly yes. releases. Yeah. <laughs> We could uh, harness Henry Kissinger's cum to, to get Europe off of, of Russian crude. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to drop the Kissinger goo on us. <laughs> um, Diane Sawyer later told New York Magazine, quote, The power of Henry working a room is still seismic. All of a sudden, everybody wants to step up their game and say something he'll find interesting or funny. And, you know, I don't Whoa. know how much of this is just like his... Na- He's clearly a charismatic man, right? He clearly has... That's, it feels that's like how- it's... 
it's yeah. dinner for schmucks, and he's like the rube. <laughs> like it feels like <laughs> it's not. Everyone's just doing like, this everyone, as a yeah, bit. <laughs> everyone's just doing a bit. Like it's just like it's incongruent with the person mm-hmm. that we I see and hear about. That you're like, yeah. oh my god, if you could get in a room with Henry Kissinger, just get right next to him. you will not leave his side. Yeah, not only, obviously fuck. he's sexy. Obviously he's sexy. <laughs> Who wouldn't want to fuck Henry Kissinger? Of Who course, would want to. <laughs> Now, this is all profoundly upsetting, but it gets yes. bleaker. So, uh, if Stop Walter Isaacson, who's, who's probably Kissinger's best biographer, if Walter Isaacson is correct, the reason all these women liked hanging around Henry wasn't just that he was powerful. And no, it was not that he had, you know, incredible dick game, which I'm sorry for saying that in the context of Henry Kissinger. Don't ever Thank you. Say Thank that you. Again. I you appreciate know how many years it. We just lost. I appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> we, we are, we just plunged in the rankings. I uh, believe that's a, that's a fireball mm-hmm. event. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, I'm going to quote now from Kissinger, a biography by Walter Isaacson. Kissinger's secret with women was not all that different from his one with men whom he wanted to charm. He flattered them. He listened to them. He nodded a lot and he made eye contact. But unlike the way he was with most men, Kissinger was exceedingly patient with women who wanted to talk. Very few men in the 1970s actually listened to women, according to Betty Lord. Henry talked with you, talked to you seriously and probed for what you knew or thought. He was someone who could and would make a Jill St. John feel intelligent or a Shirley MacLaine feel politically savvy. Next to Ingmar Bergman, he is the most interesting man I have ever met, said Liv Ullman. He is surrounded by a fascinating aura, a strange field of light, and he catches you in some kind of invisible net. Over long dinners at public places, he would listen with sympathy while women talked about themselves, their lives, their hopes, and even sometimes their slightly wacky New Age philosophies. He would call them on the telephone late at night and talk for an hour or more at a time. He was a great friend, especially a telephone friend, always there when you needed him, said Jill St. John. The dirty little secret about Kissinger's relationship with women was that there was no dirty little secret. He liked to go out with them, but not home with them. His fascination with affairs tended to be foreign rather than domestic. Henry's idea of being romantic was to slow down his car when he dropped you off at a date, said Hauer. He may have been, how, in fact, the most celibate lecher in Washington. People say, yes, he doesn't do anything with, this, with these girls, his friend Peter Peterson once remarked. Wait, well, yeah. this is, what, is what the fuck is happening? So he's a it's, little asexual... I don't know if he, I mean, he definitely had sex, he had relationships, he had kids, but I think the the being seen with women, the being seen as a sex symbol wasn't, but I don't think he had a particularly high sex drive. I don't think he's going out and like fucking his way through like famous people. I think he likes being seen in public with beautiful women. And I think beautiful women, number one, he's safe. Like he's not going to pressure you for anything. And number two, he'll actually listen to you. Like he's Which good is, company. It's, it's, it's an extremely yeah. low bar. So, it's I mean, really it, bleak, right? There is, there, there is like something to that. You know, it's like he's he's doing. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that even now with guys like when I yeah. hear like guys talk, you're like, yeah, it's like just be respectful and it'll yeah. probably get you like, I mean, it at least makes you not an asshole. Yeah. I mean, he's 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 you know what it is, I think. The, the women in this situation are getting something out of it, right? Being with Henry Kissinger gets you in the news. It raises your profile. He's extremely famous and powerful. Um, and you get taken maybe even more seriously, you know, as as a woman who's a, who's a, who's a journalist who wants to be seen as kind of intellectual. Um, being around Henry Kissinger, he's a very serious public intellectual. It's good for your career. And also, he's just – men in power were so much worse then than they even are now that he – was like the best dude in that world you could hang out. With. He's kind of like it. It's almost like a Batman villain again, in the sense that like he's got he's this evil piece of shit, mm-hmm. but yet he is also able to hold a conversation and not be a prick. And you're like, wow, who could pull yeah. off such opposing forces? <laughs> yeah, he treats women like humans. That's exactly. His magic. He yeah, kills like literally, that is his magic. He, he and is yet, the, uh, he will look a woman in the eyes. <laughs> yeah, he, he is makes the only. Jill St. John feel smart. The guy is a magician. Yeah, he is the only. 
he is the only man in power in Washington, D.C. who will, like, sit down with a woman and listen to what she has to say. Right. And as a result, right. he is the primary sex symbol of 1970s <laughs> Washington, D.C. <laughs> so low. It's, I mean, <laughs> it's incredible. It also, again, is it comes down to what we've talked about before with him, which is media normalization and how it is just once you kind of create that bubble, it, mm -hmm. it, it most people just acquiesce. And then you're just yeah. like, you know, you kind of like Diane Sawyer is just like, oh, yeah, well, he's people don't throw bricks at him when he's outside. So mm -hmm. he's OK. Now, Isaacson's yeah. gives an example of a typical rela uh, relationship, uh, Kissinger's friendship with Jan Golding, who's a New York socialite he dated from 70 to 71. She was 22. He's like 50. Um, oh. And Kissinger had been given her oh. name by <laughs> Kissinger Fuck, had been man. given her name by by Kirk Douglas. Oh, oh Jesus oh. Christ! Kirk Douglas is the fucking hookup in this case. Oh my god! <laughs> so <clears throat> Henry calls her one day without warning and asks if she wants to come out for dinner. When she flew out down to D.C. to meet him, she was met at the airport by one of Kissinger's military aides, who drove her to a fancy club where he was dining. The two sat down to eat, and midway through dinner, Henry got a phone call and stayed away for 40 minutes. When he came back, he apologized and said that the Secretary of State had needed his advice. But whenever he was present, he paid close, close attention to her, and he asked her her opinion on issues of the day. She found the overall experience heady. The two dated for half a year without any romance ever developing. Isaacson writes, quote, only once did they go back to his apartment, and when they arrived, an aide was there fielding telephone calls. By Golding's count, the phone rang 40 times. You couldn't do anything romantic in that place, even if you were dying to, she recalled. Who's dying? Nobody's dying she to. Is. She wants to get fucked by the old weirdo. Oh. Yeah, she's, she's, she's into it. I must uh, warn yeah. you, my cock is horned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she said, I just don't think Henry was interested in sex. When it came time to perform, well, I just think he was too preoccupied for it. He didn't have time for it. Power for him may have been the aphrodisiac, but it was also the climax. Oh, my God. That's oh, what he, God. <laughs> oh, he I know. That's a line right yeah. there. That's what he was I doing was in just... the bathroom for 40 minutes. <laughs> yeah. oh, oh, oh. oh, Henry. So on one occasion, Henry was more honest than usual with one of his female friends, Oriana Falacci, who's a, an Italian author and a former World War II partisan. She's actually a pretty fascinating person. Um, he said, quote, when I speak to Lee Duc Tho, who is the, the Vietnamese negotiator for North Vietnam, I know what I have to do with Lee Duc Tho. And when I'm with girls, I know what I must do with girls. Besides, Lee Duc Tho doesn't at all agree to negotiate with me because I represent an example of moral rectitude. This frivolous reputation, it's partially exaggerated, of course. What counts is to what degree women are part of my life, a central preoccupation. Well, they aren't that at all. For me, women are only a diversion, a hobby. Nobody spends too much time with his hobbies. See, for a minute there, you're sort of thinking, okay, well, if he if he's getting something out of female accompaniment, then in a way that is, I mean, it, there's something kind of like, there is is something kind of nice about the idea that a guy is just not like trying to yeah. fuck his way through, you know, beautiful women. Like he is just enjoying the company of women. But then the more you kind of peel back, the more it just does seem to be, a re like he's just a w he's just backwards he's a backwards yeah. person every part of him has just been rearranged he's like a, a, a mannequin body of guts that fell down and was put back improperly <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now the surprise kirk douglas cameo there may key you in on the fact that henry was also very popular with the celeb set during a party thrown for gloria steinem by the talk show host barbara hauer kissinger oh told those assembled I am a secret swinger. Oh. Now, <clears throat> yes. Uh, yeah, that's but a thing he claimed. I like I, any hole. <laughs> maybe that, it's that, a joke. <laughs> yeah, that means he's, likes, he, he's saying he likes to fuck, but all the evidence we have is that he doesn't like to yeah, fuck. Yeah, I I, again, I think that's him myth-making. I think I that's just him saying that. Yeah. I like to go around and touch the genitals of fucking people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you go to a swingers party in D.C. and Henry's just there putting a finger on things. Is it okay if I penetrate <laughs> both of you with the pinky rings? <laughs> I get nothing out of this. It's fine. Uh, don't worry, I'm cumless. <laughs> so Kissinger missed the announcement that he'd been nominated for Secretary of State because he was on a date with Norwegian Oscar nominee Liv Ullman. He took Candace Bergen out on a date when she was a young star. She later said that he gave her, quote, the sense of shared secrets, probably the same set he gave every anti-war actress. Like he would act like, oh, I'm really against the war. I'm, I'm inside the administration, like trying to get us yeah. out of these things. You know, Psycho. it's this like, 
Yeah, he's he's just, he doesn't he's he yeah he's a psycho. Psycho. I don't know I mean, what else to yeah. say about. No, it's just I mean yeah. he's completely. Yeah. I mean everything we've heard is completely contrary yeah. to he's that. He's the so fucking he's, devil. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so it's just uh, psychotic. But also you have to credit like I don't think Candace Bergen is lying. I can imagine how yeah you're not privy at that point in time to any of what we have right to any of this totally. information we have about how much he was planning this about what a two faced liar he was. So maybe you believe, yeah, this man is so intelligent and is so like emotionally competent. I can't imagine him being the architect of these war crimes. He must be just, it, it's such a titanic system of evil and he's fighting alone to bring it down. And like, it must be why Hillary Clinton still hangs around him. He's like, look, I had nothing to do with any of that, Hillary. <laughs> Don't worry. We'll talk about that, Gareth. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, Go. no. oh, great. <laughs> oh, God. Um, so I'm going to quote next from Niall Ferguson's Kissinger. Quote, for the press, the story was irresistible. The dowdy Harvard professor reborn in Hollywood as Cary Grant with a German accent. When Marlon Brando pulled out of the New York premiere of The Godfather, its executive producer Robert Evans unhes unhesitatingly called Kissinger, and Kissinger ob obligingly flew up despite blizzard conditions and a schedule the next day that began with an early morning meeting with the Joint Chiefs of Staff to discuss the mining of Haiphong Harbor and ended with a secret flight to Moscow. A reporter asked, Dr. Kissinger, why are you here tonight at the Godfather <laughs> premiere? Kissinger responded, I was forced. By who? By Bobby, Bobby Evans. Did he make you an offer you couldn't refuse? Yes. As they fought their way through the throng, Evans had Kissinger on one arm and Ali McGraw on the other. What in what the, the fuck is I know, happening? right? Would you have called that when we started this shit? No, it's I mean, like, you've, slowly, is... <laughs> you've lulled us into this being okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because at, at the beginning, absolutely not. But now, I mean, imagine, I, honestly, like a war criminal on a red mm -hmm. carpet going like, look, I didn't want to. Obviously, I want to stay in South Vietnam. But Bobby called. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know Bobby. <laughs> oh, man. It's incredible. You know wh who else attended the premiere of The Godfather with producer Robert Evans and Ali McGraw? That, I can't wait to hear. The sponsors of this show all oh, deeply uh. tied in. Well, of course they are, right? Like, they're the kind of people who get invited to hunt children on <laughs> private island reserve off the yeah. coast of Indonesia, you know? It's, I, I've heard it's an archipelago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I refuse Ooh. to believe that Hollywood producer Robert Evans did not hunt children for sport at least once. <laughs> There's just no way. Yeah. Those glasses were just scopes. Yeah. He laughed like a man who has hunted the most dangerous game. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, here's ads. We're back. Now, in our Cambodia episode, I mentioned, and by the way, we're done with the sex stuff. You made uh, it through. Wow. We did it. We did I ripped it. my sweatpants. My sweatpants <laughs> half ripped. God. Oh. Get, please get back to the killer. <laughs> well, <laughs> don't worry. In our, <laughs> in our Cambodia episode, I mentioned that the illegal bombing of Cambodia was leaked to the New York Times. And this was a big story. And it prompted Nixon to suspect that Kissinger's liberal staffers um, had uh, been the ones who had done the leaking. Um, and so after this gets leaked, Kissinger and Nixon work together to orchestrate a wiretapping program. While Kissinger initially ran the whole program, he was actually in charge for only like a day. Nixon decided pretty quickly that he didn't trust Kissinger after all, namely because Herbert Hoover expected that Kissinger was the one leaking things. And this is because Kissinger absolutely was leaking things. <laughs> now, he was not leaking the bombing of Cambodia, right? But Kissinger had his favorite journalists that he'd leak things to. Um, some of them were guys he wanted to write a book about him, you know, and so he wanted them to give him positive coverage. Some of them were like leaks in order to hurt other people in the administration because there's just constant, it's Nixon's, we're not getting into this enough, but Nixon's administration is just like an endless series of power struggles. Everyone is fucking yeah. over everybody else, right? Yeah, right? Like that's that's the Nixon administration. Right. Yeah, it's incredible. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really quite quite a tale. Um <laughs> so yeah, Kissinger's absolutely leaking some stuff. And that's it. Nixon is pretty aware of who Kissinger is leaking things to. Um and as Walter Isaacson writes, the real reason why he pulled Henry from overseeing the program was that the two were having one of their periodic feuds. Nixon actually made the call to pull Kissinger uh, from the wiretapping program right before he flew to Camp David and like stopped returning Kissinger's phone calls for a week. Oh it's this like God. thing they, they it was like it's like fucking 19 year olds fighting. It's very Tell him I'm not here. Yeah. 
They literally had just little tiffs, and they yeah, they have little tiffs. You know, they got so their, send they them to voicemail. Put them to voicemail. <laughs> <laughs> they are, there's so much petty bullshit between Kissinger and Nixon, and they're it's very so much like if you've ever been in a codependent relationship, the Kissinger and Nixon will seem extremely familiar because they'll like yeah. be fighting over some stupid bullshit, and then things will get bad, and they'll like come together and be like all collapsing at the same time as they're propping each other up. It's very funny. Look, um, I got. To I mean, say. millions die, but. <laughs> I'm sorry that I said that to you earlier. Well, I've been waiting for your apology. I can't stay mad at you. That's how I Who feel else about will I you. bomb Cambodia with? Look, we have too many people to kill to stay mad at each other for this long, huh? <laughs> so get over here, you piece of shit. Despite Kissinger Nixon periodically being angry with him throughout the duration of the wiretapping program, Henry Kissinger retained the ability to pretty much wiretap American citizens at command. He would submit names to the FBI, who would start a wiretap on that person. When the secret wiretapping program was leaked in 1973, and it blew up into a big congressional inquiry, Nixon took the blame, defending Kissinger by saying it was his responsibility not to control the program, but solely to furnish information to the FBI. So what they claimed is like, Kissinger wasn't ordering wiretaps, he was giving the FBI information on people we thought were suspicious, and they would decide to wiretap. And it's a right. coincidence that all he would do was hand them a name and they would immediately start the wiretap right <laughs> it's like he would give the garment to the bloodhound but he yeah, would exactly hunt the person but he's not away. hunting the he's child not looking for him on go for, yeah <laughs> so it, it's also though like this might be the moment that proves dick nixon was actually a better person than henry kissinger because, oh, God. Like, Shit. He, Just... because he did like kind of take a hit for his team uh, yeah, <laughs> Not that okay. he wasn't responsible for the wiretapping. It's a very low bar, but you're right. It's was like, too. Yeah. In the land of no respect, a man with one mm -hmm. ounce has it all. Mm -hmm. uh, it was like a tiny, tiny dollop, if you will, of honor yes, <laughs> from will. Henry Kissinger. <laughs> yeah, okay. and we just never see that, uh, or from from Nixon, and we yeah. just never see that from Kissinger. <laughs> um, I, it's kind of like saying that like a cheese grater is better to fuck than the blade of a jigsaw, but you know. It's something. Boy, that one, that got really I mean, no, Well, no, that now that I think about it, I mean, if someone laid it on the table, <laughs> I mean, if you had head, to pick, you'd be like, right? Yeah. Well, uh, let's <laughs> give me that cheese grater. Yeah. Let's grate this cheese. What do we say, gentlemen? I'm going to drop trout. Let's get grating. <laughs> so here's how the secret wiretapping program worked. Kissinger and another Nixon dude, I think it was Haldeman, um, would submit names to the FBI, which the FBI viewed as requests, right? The transcripts of that person's conversations then would all be sent to Kissinger's death desk. So he got direct transcripts of every wiretap personally, and he would decide what to bring to Nixon. He wasn't the only guy. He Because, again, Nixon had multiple, like, people kind of competing through this program, right? Right. He's like um, the head writer. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So James Adams, head of the FBI's intelligence division, later told a biography that he did not think there was, quote, more or less wiretapping under Nixon than under previous presidents. What made things unusual then was that the wiretaps Nixon and Kissinger ordered were on NSC staff, individuals that were part of the White House family, in Isaacson's wow. words, right? Quote, in other words, previous wiretaps had mainly been on suspected spies, potentially subversive union leaders and the like. A regular program of wiretapping one's own aides was, according to Thomas Smith, another top FBI official, unprecedented. So, oh, my God. It, it, it's amazing. <laughs> like, that's what's amazing, right? It's like, yeah. well, no, it's not unusual to ask for this many wiretaps. Yeah. It's just normally on people that you're worried about, like, attacking the yeah. country, not people who you've hired. The FBI is like... <laughs> You know, we're okay with spying on dissidents, but they made us spy on their friends and we feel gross yeah. about this. Like, Did you see Henry Kissinger's wiretapping Nixon? Yeah. He's yeah. getting very catty. Uh, Kissinger's just asked for a wiretap on himself. Okay. I want to see what I'm up to. I don't David, trust myself. You were joking, but you have accurately predicted where the story goes. No! What the fuck? This is Look, such a weird uh, chapter of American politics. I don't history. trust me as far as I can throw myself. Oh my god, I am I am such a fucking asshole. Look at what I was saying. Oh my god. So these wiretaps were all considered legal at the time. Although the Supreme Court did later determine that they were illegal, it was kind of like one of these at the time they were legal and because yeah. of how gross they were, the Supreme Court was like, "You know what?" No. Um, and thankfully, the U.S. never, never wiretapped people that, again. That's um, the that, end of it. That's, that's the right. end of it. Mm -hmm. 
Famously. That's why Edward Snowden is famous for his reveal that no one was ever wiretapped again. That's why we don't know who Edward Snowden is. <laughs> yes. Famous private citizen living in Ohio, Edward Just Snowden. <laughs> pull a name out of the air. <laughs> Random guy. <laughs> um, so a tremendous amount has been written on the subject of the wiretapping in the Nixon administration. I'm not going to go too into detail on it because as sleazy as it is, wiretapping your friends doesn't quite measure up to war crimes. Like it's gross, but it's also yeah. not that gross in context. It's super you know? weird. Yeah. yeah, it's just like weird. It's a weird thing about them. There is something I should read here that reveals something meaningful about Henry's character. William Sapphire was a New York Times op-ed columnist and a Nixon speech and a Nixon speech writer. He later said that Kissinger was quote capable of getting a special thrill out of working most closely with those he spied on the most. So like oh Sapphire's attitude is like he was doing this mainly because he thought it was like kind of hot to to be wiretapping a guy that he this was working next to. This is how he orgasms. To. Yeah, so finally. He, it's the power thing. He, it's the power thing, yeah. He knows, he's he loves that he's like fucking over someone he's just hanging out with and talking to and they don't know. He's, it's like it, Sliver. He gets like a, yeah, he gets yeah. like this crazy thrill out of it. Yeah. He, the, he, he knows <sighs> secrets about them. Like, oh God, it's so fucking weird. I'm going to it, wider it, tap that ass. <laughs> <laughs> so he gets like yeah th th that quote from kissinger power is the ultimate aphrodisiac it's usually translated to him being like that's why women are so into me right because power turns people on but i think it literally means that like he kind of right. gets off on on exercising yeah. power yeah. right like 100 percent. that's his thing oh my god i can even fuck my friends over <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it is also worth noting that henry wiretapped himself once he took office, he had a secretary. I was kidding. <laughs> I know, I, I know, but it happened. Robert. <laughs> Once he took office, he had a secretary listen in on all of his calls and take oh. memo notes on his conversations. Uh -oh. He also had a series of what are called dead key extensions added to phones. These are keys that were secretly added to phones in his office so that his secretaries and aides could like press them to listen in on calls Tep without other people knowing and take what? notes on the calls. Oh, when uh. Nixon. When Nixon would call Kissinger drunk, slurring his words, Kissinger would like wave all of his people and be like, get in here, get in here, get in here. Like, pick up the phone, pick up the phone. It's like and a Ghostbusters. We got one. <laughs> and then he would make faces making fun of the president while his notes, his like aides listened in. Okay. I mean, let, 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 just, okay. just take I actually, a I'm, I'm, That's I'm the coolest thing side. about I'm him. I'm on his yeah. side now. Take a step back and realize <laughs> that Henry Kissinger is making fun of the wiretap he's called on himself while he's talking to the president who's blackout drunk. It's it's something else. While a war is it happening. Is, like not to minimize how fucked up, you know, the current administration to the previous administration was, but by God, America still has not reached the Nixon peak of craziness. We've in the White gotten House. it in like, like pieces, but little we've never had the full and company. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, we've never had like the full team together again. Yeah, you can't. It's it's really hard to compete with Dick Nixon and Henry Kissinger. <laughs> and I mean, I'm like, talking about ahead of his time. Oh my God, <laughs> his stuff ages great. Oh man. So Kissinger also used the transcripts he made to attack his coworkers and reinforce his loyalty to the president. When his colleagues said something to him that he knew Nixon would hate, or when someone made a comment agreeing with Kissinger on an issue, he would pass those notes from his secret conversations on to the president. So he would hand the president like a transcript of a call he'd had with like a thing underlined that made Kissinger look good. Um, oh my God. That's from just... Kissinger, a biography, quote, William Sapphire, who dubbed the transcripts the Dead Key Scrolls, said he once saw Kissinger altering one to shore up a point he wanted to make to the president. He had been chewing out a reporter from the Christian Science Monitor for writing a story that was unfavorable to Nixon. In doing so, he also tossed in occasional complaints about the perfidy of Secretary Rogers. Since he was planning to send the transcript to the president, Sapphire said, he had taken a draft and edited it adding to the fierce loyalty of his own remarks. So he would like mark it up to make him like be more of a kiss ass to kick to Nixon. I mean, fucking incredible. <laughs> it's I also, know. Nixon's also like hammered. It's like, how hard do you have to work to like convince mm -hmm. this guy? You know what I mean? Yeah. Hand him a Mai Tai. Like yeah, it's just easy. Like, Here you go. This is from Trader Vic's. Like you're my best friend. Well, I love you, Henry. I've never had a closer friend than you, Hank. Look, look at how much of a, of your bitch I am. <laughs> <Look> <laughs> 
The existence of these transcripts was revealed by the Washington Post in 1971, but Kissinger insisted they were just for the president's files. In reality, <laughs> he used them for as notes to write to his two books that he published after leaving power. Uh, but he wow. was canny enough to know they had damning information. So when he considered quitting the Nixon administration in 1973, he had them all shipped to a bomb shelter at Nelson Rockefeller's house. I mean, what l- the listen fuck? to what, what you just said. Just happened? I listen know, to right? what you just said. I know. I mean, Every third sentence you have to write about these guys. You, you know, it feels like thing. magnet fridge poetry. Yeah. Yeah. He illegally hid government files in Nelson Rockefeller's private bomb shelter. It's just like, hey, it feels hey, like. Uh, Rock, Rockefeller, may I use your bomb shelter for storage? <laughs> I need to put my biography notes there. Of course, of course, Henry. That's you. You know what I always say: my Bob Shelter's yours. These are these are what short stories, right? Yes. Sure. Yeah. Whatever in, in you need I, to tell yourself. I need I need them safe in case there's a nuclear war. <laughs> So, obviously, this is very illegal. Um, And when Kissinger decided not to quit the administration, he had a military liaison send a plane to pick them up from Rockefeller's house. And then he hid them in a bomb shelter under the White House. Oh, after he left. What the fuck? (laughs) There's no rules for these people. Uh. They're fucking notes. They don't need to survive the fucking nuclear holocaust. How great, though, if a bomb is incoming towards the White House and they all go there and it's just stacked with Kissinger papers. Yeah. (laughs) Wow, this this guy was a real piece of shit. This is awkward. I think we're all going to perish. Yeah, he's just sitting in the corner. I don't think you should read those. (laughs) (laughs) So after he left office, Kissinger donated the papers to the Library of Congress under the restriction that they would not be made available until he had been dead for five years. Well, he's been dead for he's been dead for five years. (laughs) We should be able to read him now. Who makes that deal? It's not a great thing. The Library of Congress. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. Uh, five, by the way, most people most people do like the after I die. He wants the five-year buffer, which sounds a little yeah. unique. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he I wants negotiate. time for people to get things out of the country. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to make sure I'm pure bone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So Kissinger was also convinced that Nixon's chief of staff, Haldeman, had Nixon wiretapped uh, uh, and Nixon. Sorry. Kissinger was also convinced that Nixon's chief of staff, Haldeman, and Nixon like had wiretapped him, uh, which they absolutely had. So Kissinger was kind of tapping himself. But Nixon had also wiretapped Kissinger. And and when he passed (laughs) Haldeman in the hall, Kissinger would say, quote, what do your taps tell you about me today? Uh, (laughs) It's almost. You remember that? Like. What was it? I don't remember what it was on where Lily Tomlin was the one ringy dingy operator who keeps mm-hmm. plugging oh, in. Yeah. It's, it's almost like that with wiretaps where you're just like yeah. every wire is getting plugged and crossed. Nixon's wiretapping Kissinger, who's wiretapping himself, who's wiretapping Nixon, who's also wiretapping Halderman, who's wiretapping Kissinger, who's also wiretapping Nixon. And th- that's why we know so much about not just like the crimes they committed, but like what they were saying in the meetings while they committed the crimes. Yeah. yeah. Because unbeknownst to Kissinger and to everyone else, Nixon was also wiretapping himself. Oh, like he recorded every conversation that he which, had in the Oval Office in again, secret. Is, is the most that that to me is like the one of the most. I mean, it's why we know so much because yeah. if you are able to like if if Trump or I mean if any of them. I mean, if you had the Bush tapes, mm-hmm. like they would be fucking oh. incredible. But mm-hmm. it's also that Nixon recorded himself and then was like, "Okay, take them," and everyone's like, "The fuck are you drunk?" And he's like, "I am actually." <laughs> Yeah. I am extreme. I am so drunk. My secretary of defense has a contingency plan in case I try to nuke everyone. Checkers You've never are been that drunk. No one has. <laughs> <laughs> so this was a secret until the Watergate scandal was revealed at the end of 1972. Kissinger was warned about this, that like the Watergate story was about to break two months ahead of time. And he was horrified by the implications Namely, by the fact, by the things we've already gone over at length, uh, that he had, like, he was on tape in these records, agreeing and encouraging with Nixon's bigotry and his copious racial slurs. So, like, Kissinger is not involved in Watergate, so he's like, I'm not worried about that. I'm worried that everyone's going to know that I was, like, egging Nixon's bigotry on in order to kiss his ass. Um Yeah. Uh, am- amazing, amazing for him to be horrified. Like, of all the things he's done... Like for this to be like it's it's always like the weirdest thing, but it's like for this to for him to be like this could really damage my credibility. 
lots of <laughs> people might think poorly of me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when he was asked about this later, about like encouraging Nixon's bigotry, Kissinger explained that the things he'd said to Nixon were based on, quote, the needs of the moment rather than to, quote, te- stand the test of deferred scrutiny, which was a nice way of saying I'm only racist around racists. In one of the most <laughs> impressive feats of mental gymnastics in political history, Kissinger actually argued that his egging Nixon on was meant to protect the American people. Quote, <laughs> he was so much in need of succor, so totally alone. Our national security depended so much on his functioning. Uh, uh, it's called Yes And, okay? <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, he, was, improv- he was Chicago school. <laughs> it's called the Improv Olympic, pal. <laughs> I mean, to, again, to be able to get away with that argument, Mm -hmm. Uh, It just should not be allowed. Now, speaking of Nixon's functioning, uh, it's probably time to talk a little more about Watergate. As previously covered, in 1971, Nixon and his team, including Kissinger, hired a goon squad of ex-FBI and CIA agents called the Plumbers and asked them to investigate the leak of the Pentagon Papers. These guys broke into the office of Daniel Ellsberg. That's the guy who leaked the Pentagon Papers. He was a, a, a Department of Defense employee. They break into the office of his psychiatrist to try and steal records to smear him. In 1972, one of the plumbers, G. Gordon Liddy, was transferred to the committee to re-elect the president. The acronym of this organization organization was literally creep because satire has never happened even once. Like, it's impossible. Nope. (laughs) It's over. It's over. (laughs) Liddy's team executed a wide-ranging plan to illegally spy on the Democratic Party, which ended with them breaking into DNC headquarters in the Watergate building in D.C. and bugging the phones of staffers. They got arrested almost immediately. Like that night they get busted, right? That's like when this all starts. Um, And so that's what like the fact that this like the Watergate scandal and public knowledge starts is like these guys getting arrested doing a break in. He's a crime reporter named Bob Woodward in on the case. He was not a political journalist. He was like a a crime beat DC reporter. But he hears about this break in and he's like, something's fucking going on here. And he winds up making, you know, contacts with a, a guy who we later eventually like decades later learned was the associate director of the FBI. That's Deep Throat, you know, right. famously. This guy gives him information and the Washington Post under Woodward and, and Bernstein, right? He has a partner in it, too. Like they're both doing very good journalism here. <clears throat> They start dropping articles at the tail end of 1972, and a trial over the break-in starts in 1973, January, right after Nixon wins re-election. While Woodward and his partner, Carl Bernstein, were running down leads, they got in touch with another FBI guy and asked him, hey, who kept authorizing all of these wiretaps? That (laughs) FBI guy said, well... Henry Kissinger. In a, in a lot of cases, it's Kissinger. He's like our main guy calling us. So Woodward calls Henry Kissinger, who plays dumb at first and then tries to blame Haldeman for the wiretapping. Woodward asked, OK, well, is it possible you were the one doing the wiretapping, Henry? And Kissinger says, I don't believe it was true. Woodward uh, asked. What? what? <laughs> yeah. That's it's such a weasel answer. Uh, he, he's four years old. <laughs> Woodward asks, is that a denial? And Kissinger responds, I frankly don't remember. Uh, I, oh I mean, my God. It, 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 it's kind of like it, it's it is kind of like nice to see the Genesis because the I don't remember thing is just mm-hmm. utilized so much now. Yeah, so it's like yeah. it's like one of the first like where you're just like. I think if I just say I forgot, I can get away with this shit. Yeah, you can imagine a a young Bill Clinton reading this news story and saying, I'm not sure why, but I I think I'm going to take notes on this. I remember uh, ejaculating, but I don't remember how that uh, come to be. (laughs) It's also, it shows you like how insulated they were in their psychotic little dome Mm -hmm. that once they actually take their tactics out in the real world, people are like, yeah, that's a crime and we have you. They're like, oh shit. (laughs) Ah, fuck! Whoopsie, whoopsie! Fuck! The president's drunk! So, Kissinger admitted after that line of questioning that he might have given the FBI the names of some people who had access to leaked documents, and, quote, it's quite possible they construed this as an authorization. (laughs) <laughs> so once he makes this admission to Woodward, Henry starts to get looser and he talks about how he figured he probably should take responsibility for the wiretapping. And then he realized almost immediately like, oh, shit, I fucked up. And he asks Bob Woodward, you aren't quoting me, right? Like he's like, this isn't on the record, is it? 
That's, so that's Woodward, how it works, too, right? You put it on the record, and then you're like, that's yeah. off record, right? Woodward says, of course this is on the record. Like, what yeah. the fuck? Like I, like, I never said this was off the record. I'm What's wrong with you? Yeah. <laughs> Kissinger insisted, well, I was only speaking on background. Quote, I've tried to be honest, and now you're going to penalize me. In five years in Washington, I've never been trapped into talking like this. Uh, if oh a journalist God. calls you and asks you questions as the... Secretary of State. You're you're calling us BFF, right? Yeah, you just wanted to chat, right? We just were just going to chew the fat for a while, I thought. How are you? What what crimes have you committed, Bob? Yeah, it's it's fascinating. It's Uh, so dumb. It's It's so so dumb. dumb. And it it shows what fucking tame little pricks the entirety of the White House press corps were, right? Yeah. Because Kissinger thought he could get away with this. And he finally encountered, like, an actual journalist for the once. Yeah, right. Like, <laughs> and just like 30 seconds with, with Woodward and he's blown wide open. And he, like, and he, does, he cannot handle it. Yeah, he's, he's yeah. just pissing his pants it's, crying. You, he's you, like, you know what it is? You've, have you seen those videos of like those fucking... Um, uh, those Tai Chi champions who are like in those videos fighting their students where they're just like flipping everyone around the room, yeah. throwing them. And then like they fight an actual MMA fighter who just like takes them down in 13 seconds. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like it's, how Seagal fights where. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's Steven Seagal. dare I say Putin's judo? Yeah. It is. This is this is the moment for Kissinger. That's like when when Steven Seagal got choked out by Jean LaBelle and shat his pants. <laughs> Uh, all right, all right hey, hey, I'm the star uh, here. Uh, I come didn't on. think this could happen. Yeah. Come on now. We play fake. Next, from Kissinger, a biography. Quote, Woodward wondered what kind of treatment Kissinger was accustomed to getting from the press. He consulted Murray Martyr, the kindly, soft-edged diplomatic reporter who covered Kissinger for the Post. Well, Martyr admitted, Henry was regularly allowed to put statements on background after he had made them. I, I mean, it really, it does. And, and what's so frustrating is that it's like, you know, they they've all kind of learned from the mistakes of this time in ways mm-hmm. where it is it's kind of the same shit. I mean, everything mm-hmm. is kind of a fluff piece. You're allowed to be in the White House press mm-hmm. corps if you ask softball questions. Yeah. You know, it like this this was like a major fuck up and they all were like, "Well, we the the lesson we've learned here is don't let good reporters around you." Yeah, t- don't <laughs> let journalists exist. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's one of those um God, there's so much going on here. Uh, it really is. This is like it, we, we are peaking. There are ways in which like there are times when journalism does work that way. Right. When I am like sitting down and talking to like a fucking dissident or or a protester, someone who like might be targeted by the state or by, you know, fucking fascist or whatever and murdered. And they like say something and then later are like, oh, you know, can I take that off the record? I'm worried that's going to like reveal me. Yeah, of course. Like, yeah. I'm not going to like. Yeah, you could get killed. But like, yeah, th- it doesn't. It should never work that way for th- cabinet level fucking government officials yeah. right. right they don't they, they can't if you agree ahead of time to make something off the record yeah that that happens that's like a thing that occurs although i think that's problematic too but like they don't get to just take something off the record retroactively that's not how it works yeah but, and, and i mean you just, just all they ahead. care about is access so they don't yeah. care about the actual story they just want to talk yeah. to them again yeah they no, want to it, keep getting access yeah. it is it's like it needs to be a a, gr- a group of people need to say that this is all fucked, but instead they're like, oh, what a great cocktail yeah. party. And Woodward, to his credit, there's critiques to make about Woodward later in his career, but to his credit, yeah. Woodward's like, I don't give a shit about access. I'm yeah. trying to take down a president. Like, I, I could give a fuck who yeah. I piss off here, you know? Like, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> So Nixon eventually took the fall, as we've covered, but the issue was brought up again in 1973 when Kissinger went through his confirmation hearings to become Secretary of State. We don't need to cover the politicking he did to secure that job, but I should note all the fallout over wiretapping and the disaster in Cambodia didn't do shit to reduce Henry's popularity at home. In 1972, he had ranked fourth on the list of most admired Americans. In 1973, he was number one, largely because Harry Truman had died. Which is also pretty bleak. What the fuck? Yeah, baby. We are. I mean, and that's when you're like, we deserve it. Mm. I mean, if you are (laughs) that incapable of deciphering reality from fiction, to some extent, you want to be taken advantage of. Yeah. Yeah. You're, You're the rube who opens the door to the vacuum cleaner salesman. 
Yeah, we're well, in a okay, yeah, pour some dirt on my floor. I want to see how yeah. this thing sucks. You need my social security number, of well, course. Okay, <laughs> and you promise I get $500,000 in the mail. Okay. <sighs> So, one congressman proposed a constitutional amendment to allow foreign-born citizens to run for president because of, like, how uh, much he liked fucking Kissinger. I don't like Henry. Henry, uh, Henry received a figure at Madame Tussaud's Wax Museum in London, which Ugh. quickly became the star attraction. Miss Ugh. Universe pageant contestants voted him, quote, the greatest person in the world today. I, is it possible that we just put a heart in the Madame Tussauds figure and melted it and that's what's walking around now? <laughs> Yeah, that's. But this we is, just left it in the is, sun for a week. Like you bring up the media, like this is just so like they just normalize <laughs> monsters. They act like monsters are great people. Yeah, and people don't actually hear the fucking heinous shit that they're doing. No, and they just hear he's a smart guy, but. It's, because that's what matters. Said so. He can like quote smart dead people that they you haven't read, but you know they're smart because their name sounds vaguely familiar, and so you're like, well, yeah. this guy's read all these smart dudes. He must be a good guy because smart yeah. people don't do bad thing. Well, and smart people yeah. don't like go out with reporters, and you know, yeah. you know, just be like, look at Frankenstein at the Playboy Mansion. Gosh, mm -hmm. he's got those bolts on his neck, and the girls love to twirl him. <laughs> <laughs> so it is perhaps not surprising even though the watergate scandal had built to a fever pitch by 73 that henry kissinger was a shoe-in to be appointed as secretary of state on the day of his first congressional confirmation hearings someone in the press asked do you prefer to be called mr secretary or dr secretary he replied i do not stand on protocol if you just call me excellency it will be okay uh, oh, excuse Jesus. me, pardon? And again, as a journalist, Fuck. the proper response to that is to throw your handheld recorder <laughs> at his face. <laughs> <laughs> like, try to take a chair to his nose yeah. like they did to Geraldo. Yeah, you know? right, like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Break his face. <laughs> oh, I'm not tongue up on titles. You can just bow and call me your majesty. <laughs> so... Kissinger was extremely nervous going into the confirmation hearings because, again, Nixon is being torn apart for Watergate right now, and he was expecting that he'd be interrogated about all the shady wiretapping he'd done. Sure. But as it turned out, all he had to do was lie and say he'd never recommended wiretapping. Everyone decided that was fine, and he was confirmed oh as Secretary of State, 78 votes to 77. Uh, Jesus oh. fucking Christ. And here's the thing. Even among the people who voted against him, there was not always strong antipathy. George McGovern voted against confirming him, but he called Kissinger afterwards to privately endorse him. To be like, hey, publicly, I gotta pretend I don't like you, but like, we're cool, <laughs> right, bro? <laughs> <laughs> And don't worry, someday I'll be the president, and I'm, yeah. uh, I got my eye on you, Henry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, honestly, that might have happened. Yeah, probably. So when he was sworn in on September 21st, 1973, a family friend presented Kissinger with a copy of the Old Testament that had be pub been published in Firth in 1801 for him to be sworn in on. Kissinger decided instead to use Nixon's copy of the King James Bible. Oh, Which, they just open it. It's a bottle of bourbon. Oh, sorry. It's, it's actually it's just a bottle oops, of liquor. Oopsie yeah. poopsie. This is that. Let's use that other one. Let's use that first one. So, alas for Dick Nixon, 74 was an even worse year for him than 73 had been. In July of that year, three Southern Democrats on the House Judiciary Committee announced that they were voting to impeach him. On August 5th, a transcript of taped conversations between him and Haldeman was released, which proved his involvement in the cover-up of the Watergate break-in and, and proved he'd lied under oath. This was the nail in the coffin. On August 7th, Barry Goldwater told Nixon he would not survive an impeachment vote. Nixon had already made the decision to leave. He met with Jerry Ford, his vice president, and told him that he was about to be president. He urged Ford to keep Kissinger on as his secretary of state. Then Nixon made his big announcement to the American people. Next, from History.com. After the speech, Kissinger accompanied Nixon to his living quarters one last time. History is going to record that you were a great president, Kissinger assured Nixon. <laughs> Henry, the president said, that will depend on who writes the history. Uh. Uh, can you imagine a wasted Nixon showing yeah. Gerald Ford around like, so this is the vodka, you probably <laughs> so, uh, put that in your Wheaties in the morning, this is pineapple, you should eat this mm -hmm. with cottage cheese every day. Now here's a Dick Nixon oh. secret, if you pour a little Diet Coke in the bourbon, they can't tell you're getting drunk at nine in the morning. Uh, when you're confused, just nod. 
<laughs> uh, when you're throwing up in the toilet, mm -hmm. say something disagreed with you and it's diarrhea. The Secret Service agents have to let you puke down their sleeves. That's what I've been doing. <laughs> This is the vodka room, and this is the vodka room, and this is the vodka room. This drawer this here's is the vodka room. this drawer here's for letters and things like stamps like that, and this is the drawer you can puke in. But just bend over and pretend you're looking for something. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest. I've been shitting in the fireplace a lot. It's hard to find the bathroom when you're turned in the oval. Look, look. If you're worried, just lift this cushion up. This chair's actually a toilet with wheels. It sits behind the desk. <laughs> <laughs> Try to think what else. Uh, these are laws. You can wipe your ass with them. <laughs> By the way, this is all being recorded. Everything <laughs> is. Wait, this chest here is actually a tape recorder. <laughs> Kissinger's sorrow over his boss stepping down was sopped somewhat by the fact that right around the same time, he'd succeeded in overthrowing an actual democratically elected leader, oh, good. Dr. Salvador Allende. Now, oh, fuck, this makes me mad. <laughs> yeah, we have we're not going to talk about this in a lot of detail because we have gone into detail on the coup against Allende in both our episodes on the Dulles brothers and on the School of the Americas. It's just like not – this is the thing to like cut out of our Kissinger story because we've covered it a lot before. But I will give an overview of Kissinger's involvement. In For this. the listeners who maybe aren't familiar, Robert. Yeah. yeah. So I know we are all on the same page, but <laughs> you're Gareth or whatever. Salvador Allende was a socialist E dude who was elected in 1970. Like all kind of socialists the U.S. overthrows, he was not nearly as radical as they pretended he was, but he was like solidly left wing. The U.S. backed a military coup that overthrew him in 1973. Allende committed suicide and was replaced by General Augusto Pinochet who tortured uh, and murdered tens of thousands of people over the next 17 uh, years. So I'm going to be brief here and I'm going to read a summary of Kissinger's role in that kerfuffle from the Transnational Institute. Less than a week after Nixon received the disappointing news about the presidential vote, he decided to annul the Chilean vote. A quote widely attributed to Secretary of State Henry Kissinger explained Nixon's morality. I don't see why we need to stand by and watch a country go communist due to the irresponsibility of its people. The issues are much too important for the Chilean voters to be left to decide for themselves. I mean, like, you are, you need to be, like, so far gone yeah. to be comfortable speaking in that way. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you, that's ghoulishly evil. I mean, it's um, just like you could come up with a version of that that would also probably sound effective, but to basically yeah. be like, look, the people have fucked up voting. They've, mm -hmm. they've wrongly voted. Oopsie yeah. poopsie. Let's yeah, just, we can't. We'll, we'll do it for them. We'll figure yeah, out. I mean, we'll take care of this again. For them. United States policy pretty much, you know, yeah. all the time in perpetuity. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's good. Um, <laughs> yeah. And and after the the bloody coup that that Kissinger and Nixon endorsed, uh, Kissinger pushed to recognize Pinochet's coup government and offered economic aid. Uh, he pressured international lending organizations to lend money to the new Chilean government. Yeah, he sucks. This is a bad thing that he did. Um, yeah. You can hear a lot more about it. And honestly, K Kissinger was involved, but like the Dulles brothers were a much bigger Ugh. part of this specific thing. So check that out in our Dulles brothers episode. All this with Raquel um, Welch on his arm. <laughs> Jill St. John, I love the way you actually the woman he does marry, Nancy McGinnis, who is also a, a fairly prominent person, is a huge fan of the overthrowing of the Chilean government. Oh. Um yeah, Henry. His, his wife is like more hardcore right wing than he is. Come to bed. <laughs> Tell me about me. how you ignored the will of the Chilean voters, Henry. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know much about the working relationship Henry had with Jerry Ford. Honestly, like they didn't spend a lot of time together. We're not going to delve super deep into it. Um, there were like th th too much to talk about still. Um, there is one thing I want to note about his relationship with, with Kiss, with Nixon, like for the first several years that he's working with Nixon, he's desperate to go to Camp David. Anytime the president invites him, he's excited to go. But then when the Watergate thing is going on and Nixon feels isolated and alone, Kissinger spends like the whole Watergate hearing time jetting around the Middle East and stuff, doing diplomacy. And right. Nixon begs him like, do you want to come hang out at Camp David with me? And Henry's like, oh, buddy, I'd love to. But, you oh, know, sounds so uh, great. I just got just... so much work i'm swamped <laughs> over here with stuff you know it's like He's such crazy a worm. Right 
gosh. <laughs> it's amazing that there's a moment at this where you're like, oh man, Dick, he did you dirty. Yeah. That's not, yeah, you like, were such you a good like friend to him. A little <laughs> yeah. bit of sympathy for Dick. She was like, yeah. you, do you want to come to summer camp, David, with me? I can't. Uh, I could parents, really use a friend. <laughs> I broke my arm. I can't uh, get any merit badges or anything this summer, my mom said. So, <laughs> oh man, it's amazing. Um, so. Yeah, there's so much to talk about. I, I I will tell you, I will note that one of the first things that Henry did as Secretary of State for President Ford was to deliberately enable another genocide, which put him just one genocide away from earning a free coffee at the Pentagon Starbucks. Oh so, my gosh, so close. I know. He'll get, he'll, he'll, he's close. <laughs> he's close, he's close. Uh, We're going to talk about that, but you know what we got to talk about right now? Hmm. Products and services that support this podcast. Finally. Hey, including Starbucks. <laughs> Commit five genocides and Starbucks will fund a sixth if it reduces the price of coffee beans. Make sure it's a venti. Oh, we're back. So in 1969, the U.S. conspired with the Indonesian dictator Suharto to encourage the illegal annexation of West Papua through what was called the Act of Free Choice. This sure. was a shameless propaganda exercise, which allowed the United States to pretend democracy, rah, 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 you get the idea. Behind the scenes support by the U.S. at the U.N. allowed Suharto to solidify his control on West Papua. This uh, led to four decades of genocidal policies, which have killed huge numbers of the Papuan population. Six years later, Suharto had another fun idea. East Timor was nearby, and near the end of a 27-year-long process of being decolonized by Portugal. Having just been ruled pretty brutally in the name of capital, you won't be surprised to hear that the East Timorese people were somewhat sympathetic towards socialism. Hmm. The leftist Freitlin, Freit, Freit, Freitlin, Freitlin party began to gain ground as freedom grew near. In 1975, it had a brief civil war with the much smaller right-wing pro-Indonesian party. This freaked out Portugal, who pulled their last people out of the country during the fighting. Seeing the territory abandoned, General Suharto felt he had an opportunity. He and others in the Indonesian military began to complain to the Americans that East Timor might be used as a base for dastardly communists to inspire secessionist movements in Indonesia. Over in... Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, you know, East Timor seems like it's going to be really bad. Yeah. Like, oh, we got to yeah. kill them. We got to get rid of them. I don't <laughs> like the sound of this. Over in East Timor, Freitlin, the Socialist Party, recognized their the fact that they were in danger. They had their, oh, we're in danger moment. Yeah. And they declared their independence on November 28th, 1975, so they could ask for help from the United Nations. Everyone ignored them. Japan, a major investor in Indonesia, twiddled her thumbs. Australia looked away. This left the United States as the only power that could potentially stop Indonesia from invading oh, East does Timor. Oh, it, does it, do we do it? What? Yeah, we did it. Yes. Everything's good now. They're doing great. Uh, They're flying cars. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yay, us again. Yeah, how many times do we have to be the heroes? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Another job well done for the United States. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> on December 6th, 1975, on the eve of the planned invasion, Gerald Ford and Henry Kissinger flew to Jakarta to meet with Suharto. The very next day, Indonesian land, air, and naval forces invaded. The timing is predominant, uh, predominant enough that people have debated ever since whether or not Kissinger and Ford gave Suharto the green light here, too. From a write-up in The Nation, Kissinger, who does not find room to mention East Timor even in the index of his three-volume memoir, has more than once stated that the invasion came to him as a surprise, and that he barely knew of the existence of the Timorese question. He was obviously lying, but the breathtaking extent of his mendacity has only just become fully apparent, with the declassification of a secret State Department telegram. The document, which has been made public by the National Security Archive at George Washington University, contains a verbatim record of the conversation among Suharto, Ford, and Kissinger. We want your understanding if we deem it necessary to take rapid or drastic action, Suharto opened bluntly. We will understand and will not press you on the issue, Ford responded. We understand the problem you have and the intentions you have. Kissinger was even more emphatic, but had an awareness of the possible spin problems back home. It is important that whatever you do succeeds quickly, he instructed the despot. We would be able to influence the reaction if whatever happens happens after we return. If you have made plans, we will do our best to keep everyone quiet until the president returns home. Micromanaging things for Suharto, he, he, he added, The president will be back on Monday at 2 p.m. Jakarta time. I we mean, understand your problem and the need to move quickly, but I am only saying it would be better if it were done after we returned. 
Uh, worst case scenario, I'll just say I never said this and nobody will ever have a transcript if they said anything. I mean, to be scheduling it like a, yeah. like a golf day. Can you crack down on the independence and freedom of these people and engage in a genocidal war? Like, once we're back, we like, just, like, there's uh, a lot do, like, going on. 3.45 or like 4 on Monday would be great. <laughs> Tuesday, if you can wait, would be unbelievable yeah, for Tuesday us. Tuesday would really, really help. Like, that's a lot of time. <laughs> mm, yeah. I thought it was a workout. Yes, that's right. Yeah. There's a lot of U.S. fuckery in fucking Indonesia. I'm sorry. I'm not going to hear this, gentlemen. That's uh, <laughs> enough of that talk, please. It's the greatest country on earth. You do have that giant Indonesia and the United States shaking hands over a burning East Timor tattoo over your heart. <laughs> well, I would hate for that. <laughs> that that's speculation. And mm -hmm. uh, please cut that out. Uh, mm -hmm. Sophie, can we make a note that that should not be included in the episode? It seems a little incriminating. So Suharto's troops, when they invaded East Timor, which they did, were equipped with the finest U.S.-made weaponry. Mm, Under the happen? Foreign Assistance Act, such materiel could only be provided to nations who would use it exclusively for self-defense. When this was brought up to Suharto, and or when this was brought up to Kissinger, and he was asked whether or not selling arms to Suharto had violated the act, Kissinger responded, it depends on how we construe it, whether it is in self-defense or it is a foreign operation. Back in D.C. on December 18th, in a meeting whose minutes are now declassified, Kissinger admitted that he knew that he, that, uh, he and, you know, the United States were violating the statute from the nation. An even more sinister note was struck later in the conversation, when Kissinger asked Suharto if he expected a long guerrilla war. The dictator replied that there will probably be a small guerrilla war, while making no promise about its duration. Bear in mind that Kissinger has already urged speed and dispatch, urged speed and dispatch upon Suharto. Adam Malik, Indonesia's prime minister at the time, later conceded in public that between 50,000 and 80,000 Timorese civilians were killed in the first 18 months of the occupation. These civilians were killed with American weapons, which Kissinger contrived to supply over congressional protests, and their murders were covered up by American diplomacy. So, uh, I mean, rough. we did it again. We did it again, back guys. To, back it, it to really, murder. It, it really is like it's it's like a like a serial killer who just gets very comfortable with killing, mm -hmm. gets kind of cocky about it, starts yeah. leaving clues. But in this case, there's no cops chasing anyone. There's yeah, nobody who's really <laughs> trying to solve the case. It's like if the Unabomber left his name on every package. Yeah. And then everyone was like, this is okay. A return yeah. address. <laughs> yeah. Ted Kaczynski, Shack 9. <laughs> roughly 300,000 East Timorese civilians, roughly half the population, were forced out of their homes and into camps during the fighting. By 1980, the death toll was at least 100,000 and possibly as high as 230,000. Thomas Meany, writing in The New Yorker, has tried to make sense of this all. Kissinger's sign-off on the Indonesian President Suharto's genocidal campaign in East Timor was meant to signal that America would unquestioningly reward those who had decimated communists within their reach. In retrospect, the notion that everything America did would be duly registered and responded to by its opponents and friends seems like an expression of geopolitical narcissism. At the time, the 33-year-old Senator Joe Biden accused Kissinger at a Senate hearing of trying to promulgate a global Monroe Doctrine. The Kissinger is that guy to where repeatedly terrible people will be like, well, you're in the right here, but only because you're talking about Henry Kissinger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, yeah, yeah, he's like, yeah, it's like. In the next episode, we're going to have a moment where the CIA is a voice of reason to give you an idea of when next <laughs> And how many people have to be the voice of reason? I mean, it, it just is like, he's like cocky. I mean, it's just, yeah. it, they're just no shits given. At this point to have no, I mean, it's not like he's had a soul throughout all of this, but you would think that once you have a soul for such a long period of time, you would start to notice the absence of a soul and at least start to act like you had a soul. Well, good news, Gareth. Nothing like that ever happens. Oh, fucking great. <laughs> Yeah, awesome. we are. We're going to have fun in episode six. Uh. Um, but, you know, now it's time to just chill out, you know, have a drink, uh, just a nice sip of the blood of, I don't know, East Timorese dissidents um, and uh, go watch the Theranos documentary. To see yeah. Henry Kissinger get <laughs> cooked by a fucking the grifter. Beat. I mean, yeah, you uh, need only only <laughs> like I forget who said it, but that's true. That's our hero. Mm -hmm. She's our hero. Yeah. This it, it, psycho it, who was like, hey, yeah, you can, you, we can do this with your blood at Walgreens because she got Henry Kissinger involved in, in 
I mean, just he's a, he's not. It's not like he's not a genius. There's no, just not no. a lot of genius it takes to just be awful and indiscriminate. Yeah, he's just like he's the best war networker schmoozing. of all time. Yeah. And here's the thing. Episode six, we're going to talk about his political downfall because he does get his comeuppance, but it's from wow. people who suck maybe even worse, at least as bad as he does. And so there's no satisfaction in it. Like, of course. And it, he's also, it's, it's also like, it's like if I mean, Hitler had gotten assassinated by Hitler too, who had then like expanded. The, yeah. Well, and it's also <laughs> by people who are like, they're there because of him. Like they, mm -hmm. like he had to walk so they could yes. run. Yes, exactly. Yes. There's someone needs to paint a picture of like Henry Kissinger, like kind of on the bow of the Titanic holding up uh, right. Dick Cheney with right, his arms right. spread wide. Oh, that yeah. feels nice. That feels real <laughs> nice, Henry. You also, you love your mm -hmm. form. Mm -hmm. Let me paint you. Kissinger walked so that Donald Rumsfeld <laughs> could stagger. Yes. <laughs> uh, but that's going to be part six. Wow. Until then, Dave. What? Gareth. You got any pluggables to plug? I want to drink like Nixon. Um, yeah. We uh, <laughs> again uh, look at what We're capitalism gets Australia, us. Australia, like uh, yeah, we Kissinger. we will be invading the shores of Australia, uh, searching for their WMDs, which we believe are north, south, east, and west. Mm -hmm. um, you can go to dolloppodcast.com dot com, and uh, I'll be also doing stand up over there. And you can go to garethreynolds.com dot com for those stand up dates. And we're also touring America this summer. Uh, sorry, we're touring the best country on earth yeah. this summer. And you can go to dollopodcast.com for all that information. Now, I should note here, y'all, that, that you guys have an ongoing uh, an ongoing argument over over whether or not Gare is an appropriate nickname for you, Gareth. And I, I felt like maybe we could bring in a negotiator mm -hmm. to help us to help us deal with this question. Yes, sure. um, so I'd like to introduce to the call Dr. <laughs> Henry Kissinger. Oh my God. This is oh, I, oh. I, I'm sorry, I said all those horrible things. <laughs> Gary is a fine name. I think Gary works great. You look like a Gary a little bit. Mm -hmm. He's got his nice shorts on. <laughs> He's got those nut huggers. Mm -hmm. oh, you, you can see the outline. <laughs> you can see the whole bread basket. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like a baby bird in a nest now, but it becomes a python when war starts. They should, they should call me Dick, shouldn't they, Dick Nixon? <laughs> <laughs> Once the bombs hit the soil, I'll rip these babies. <laughs> I really hope people stop listening at this point. I so, so desperately. I stop. I stop listening and I'm talking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, everybody. All right. We'll see you on Thursday. Behind the Bastards is a production of Cool Zone Media. For more from Cool Zone Media, visit our website, coolzonemedia.com. Or check us out on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.